Today it's my pleasure to talk to Gabrielle Beaumont here in Fauna Luch. Gabrielle's life and her work and her pleasure has taken her all around the world when she's got many stories to tell us. Welcome to Boat Radio, Gabrielle. Thank you very much, Shirley. It's a pleasure. So can you start at the very beginning and, and with all your illustrious career in films, television and, uh, and, and more, uh, but I'll leave you to tell that story. Where did it all begin? Well, it began, I think, because my parents were actors and my grandparents and my great uncle was a famous actor called Gerald du Maurier and his daughter was Daphne du Maurier, who was my mother's first cousin. So we were very much a theatrical family. So showbiz was in running through the veins. And in 1946, my parents took a theatre company on tour around the world, ending up in New Zealand, where we um, were for a year or so. And funnily enough, on the trip, we went to America, and Life magazine had a full-size picture of me in a mink coat standing on the edge of a plane, um, entrance to a plane. Uh, saying, England Shirley Temple has come to America. <laughs> how, do you, how old were you when you had a mink coat? Well, it was my mother's <laughs> mink coat, I have to say, but I've got the picture somewhere. Um, and so I was fated around America as England Shirley Temple, and I wasn't doing anything except I could tap dance, but that was it. So that was the beginning of showbiz for me. Okay, so 1946, you're in New Zealand, you're going around the world, and, th and then what? Did you, were you part of the theatre troupe for oh, your yes. parents? Definitely, and in fact, I played um, the smallest lost boy in Peter Pan until I got, I, I went up, the, as I got older, I ended up as Tiger Lily. Because <laughs> my mother had actually played Peter Pan in the West End. She took over from um, Gladys Cooper, who used to be Peter Pan, because Gerald du Maurier, her, her uncle, always played Captain Hook and Mr. Darling, and they were all great friends of the, of the Llewellyns, you know, and, the, and who wrote Peter Pan, so... Wow. So that was kind of part of the history. So Peter Pan was com really part of your life. I yeah. mean, not, not just a book, but a total experience for you. Absolutely. How many years did you manage to still play a lost boy? Oh, only until I was about 12. <laughs> <laughs> right, take us on the next bit of the journey then. Well, it's difficult to say. I mean, then I led a fairly normal life, went to school, all of that sort of stuff. Um, spent all my holidays in Ireland with um, m my aunt, my mother's sister, who married an Irishman. Had a sort of wonderful tomboy existence there. Um, used to, I learned how to sail and ride and fish and hunt and shoot and play tennis and all of these things. So I had a great childhood. I was at school in London because my pe mother was still working in the theatre, but I had holidays in Ireland. And then when I was 18, tragically, my parents died. My mother had cancer, and my father, well, three months before, my father actually, um, who'd sort of gone off to Ibiza to find himself, I'm afraid, drank too much, and his heart gave out. <laughs> but they were only 50 and 54, and having been actors, uh, there wasn't anything in the coffers, and they left me with nothing except a brother of 12. Oh. So that was the next journey of my life. So the charmed life and the mink coats gave way to two orphans? Well, unfortunately, I was just 18, so I didn't count as an orphan. Or perhaps it was fortunate, because I wasn't put in a home. But the Actors' Orphanage helped us, and uh, help, helped us out, and so on. So that was, that was okay. And I just got a scholarship to Oxford, which I couldn't take up, because I had to look after my little brat, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so you're based in London at this stage, then, are you? We were in London in a flat that my parents had, which was like three pounds a week still, because we'd been there for... 21 years, I didn't know that I had the right to stay there. And the landlord said he was so sorry about the fact that my parents had died and that he'd let us stay on for no rent for six months while we found somewhere else to go because he'd have to put the rent up to 20 pounds. What did I know? I mean, I didn't have anybody to go and ask what for. Fortunately, my brother was at a Catholic boarding school and they, they let him stay on, you know, during the term. I didn't, couldn't pay anything at the time, but they were very helpful one good reason to be a Catholic I suppose um, and so then I had to get a job so I um, the only business I knew was showbiz so I got a few jobs acting and ASMing and so on and so forth and eventually I did have a very special godfather who was an actor called John Gilgood 
And <laughs> you can't get much more special than that. John Gilgood is your godfather. Yeah. Right, OK. <laughs> so he helped get me an interview at the BBC um, to get into the BBC um, to train uh, to be a, a director. I mean, I did lots of odd jobs and everything else in between, and we, we lived on a boat in, in, in the... Uh, the only thing... I, when my mother died, I found £500 in a box under her bed, what, those white £5 notes. <laughs> and with it, because we had to leave the, the, the flat, I bought um, a boat for £500 on the Thames, Chelsea Reach, you know, all those old landing craft boats. So we moved into that, and Christopher was quite good at carpentry, so we di sort of did it up. And then one day when the tide came in, a large sleeper, railway sleeper, got stuck between me and the boat next door, which actually was owned by Dorothy Tutin. And our two boats stayed on the mud. <laughs> the water came in. So that was one of our adventures. So you had, a, you had an actor's enclave ready-made on the, on the Thames? Absolutely, <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> it, was a, it was a great time. I mean... My, all my friends, of course, were actor friends of my parents, and they were very helpful. So, but the thing was, it was either sink or swim, and so I swam. So, so you're living, living on the Thames. Is your brother still in boarding school at this stage? Yes, or, and right. he, he comes home at the weekends. Right. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, during the holidays, he still used to go to Ireland. He wouldn't help us financially, but they let him go and stay over there during the holidays. So you're so you've got a double reason for making progress. I mean, partly that you have to support yourself, and the other is you've got a burning desire for your own career. Uh, well, the first is yes, I had to support myself. Um, I didn't have a burning desire for my own career because I had not intended to be a film director or even in the business anymore. I had a burning desire to make money um, and to survive for Christopher as well, and. When I was still acting and messing around and trying to do it, I thought the only thing is to be a director because they get paid the most. Ah, so it was a financial, a financial push that made you go in that direction? In, in, in the first instance, yes. Mm. yes. So, so where did it all begin then? Was it conventionally with, within the BBC or did you do uh, well, other things? I trained at the BBC and they had a director's training course and they would take on five people who had degrees. Uh, for this training course. Well, I hadn't got my degree because I'd not been able to go. But I, I got help. I was doing, at the time I was working in the theatre as an actress, and I had actually been in a play in the West End. I'd taken over from the lead in it because I'd been the understudy. And the director said to me that he thought that I would be better off on the other side <laughs> of the camera or the other side. He said, your trouble is, he said, you're not... Fat, you're just beautifully built, he said. But I was, I was in this play and I was understudying and I got, I got to play opposite Albert Finney. Was it Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner or Taste of Honey? I can't remember. But anyway, I was tested for the lead in this play, in this film. And it was, in the end, either me or Julie Christie. And the director said to me, who was um, Joe Losey, he said, look, Gabrielle, he said, you're, you're a very good actress. But in this part, in this play, the best friend is always referred to as being too plump. And you're not plump, but you're not thin enough for the screen because it makes you look bigger. So we're going to go with Julie Christie. <laughs> That's a fantastic story. <laughs> so, so I said, OK, what am I going to do now? And he said, um, well, maybe you should try and be a director or something. So I said, oh, yeah, right, you know, I'm 21 years old and you're telling me I should go and be a director and I'm still supporting my brother and da-da-da-da-da-da and I got quite cross, I stamped my feet and walked out. Two weeks later, I got a call from the BBC and it was from the head of plays there, Sidney Newman, who was a Canadian, he was lovely. He said, um, Joseph, uh, Joe Losey says, I have to meet you. So I went in and I saw him and he said, would you like to be a director? I said, uh, yeah, I suppose so. That would be good, wouldn't it? I said, does it pay well? <laughs> he said, well, I have one place left in the director's um, training course. And normally we have to take someone with a, with a degree or someone with a theatre background. Well, you have a theatre background and you did get a scholarship to Oxford. So I'm going to offer you the place. He said, we've never had a woman in here before. 
Anyway, the rest of the course was um, Michael Tuckner, David Giles, um, Ken Loach, me, and oh, I can't remember the fifth one. And that was the beginning of my career. So, uh, so what form did the course take? Was it over a number of years? It was a year, the course, and you d learned everything about di about directing, obviously, editing, everything. And then at the end of it, you did a um, each did a little film, and everyone else worked on it as a PA or a cameraman or whatever. And at the end of it, you had your own little film. So then you got offers from the BBC to direct this, that, and the other, or whatever. But unfortunately, I was too young because. The BBC worked on a, on a scale that if you were of a certain age, you couldn't be a director if you were over under 27. Ridiculous. So they offered me a job as a PA, which is, it was like a first assistant. So I did that for a little while, and I thought, blow this for a game of soldiers. And um, I decided to try and produce my own film. So you're talking about being about 22 or 23, yes, are you? Yeah. Right, and you're producing your own film. Yes. All right, tell us about this film. <laughs> uh, it was called Velvet House. Um, I was actually working as a sort of runner, driver, come everything for a small film company. And they said, can you go and pick up two American producers from the airport? Because we were going to be in talks with them about making a film. So I drove to the airport and I picked up these two young guys, Chris Dewey, and Dennis Friedland, they were called. I'll never forget them. And they were about 25, 26. And they started a film company called Canon Films. And they were looking to, to invest some money in a film. And they were on their way to the Cannes Film Festival. Well, by the time I'd picked them up and take them to their hotel and had a drink with them, I'd sold them an idea I had to make a film. They said, all right, we won't tell the people that you're working for, but we'll, we'll try and see what we can do about this. So... The next day, they had meetings and so on. Two days later, I drove them to the airport to go to Cannes. And the next day, they called me and said, we want you to come to Cannes. So I said, well, I can't just come to Cannes. They said, yes, we'll arrange a ticket for you. And so I was actually staying with someone down in the country, and I said, I'm supposed to go to Cannes tomorrow, and I haven't got any clothes, and I haven't got anything, I haven't even got a handbag, you know. So they dressed me up in the best clothes they could find, drove me to the airport, stuck me on the plane to Cannes where I was, you know, told, that, and the two guys that night had a sort of, you know, all that goes on the camera. They said, this is um, Gabrielle Beaumont. She's going to produce and direct a, a film for us. And so they said, tell them about the film. So I laid out my outline, which, <laughs> which was like a, a thriller. It was a sort of psychological thriller with five people, so I could do it very cheaply. And that was it. And uh, when, I drove, when we went back to the airport, they gave me $10,000 in cash and said, do a budget, do this, do that. We'll be back in two weeks. And were they based in, uh, in L.A.? Yeah. No, New York. They were based in, in New, York. New York. So this was your, your beginning of your work in, with the American market? Yes, it was. And in fact, it was interesting because I made the film for £75,000. Um, I knew nothing about making a film, really. I mean, I knew how to direct it and all that. So my budget was literally a list of what things would cost and a list of what I needed. But I got around me everybody I could who was very experienced and said, listen, this is the first film, but if you work with me for basically basic wage, when I become very famous, I'll always use you. So they said, yeah, yeah, OK, Gabrielle. <laughs> all right, we'll give it a go. And that was it. And it won the Paris Film Festival. It won... Um, as a psychological thriller, it won lots of awards, and it was called Velvet House with Michael Goff and Yvonne Mitchell. And uh, that was the beginning, really, of my career. And then, then I made a couple more films with them, and then they sold it to these, <coughs> these Israelis called uh, Golan and Globus. They sold the company. I started doing a film for them, and it was a nightmare, so I said, that's it, enough of that. By this time, but with the godsend, I went to L.A. because it... Um, it got in the top 10. And so I went to LA because I stayed in some grotty little flat, you know, and met one or two people and got offered my first job. <laughs> so can we just recap on the age? You're still under 30, I presume, then, are you? Yeah. And, and the, the job was? I was directing, I was offered a job directing, um, the first one was Greatest American Hero, which people probably haven't heard of now because it was a long time ago. Then I, then I was asked by um, Goldberg uh, to direct something. No, Aaron Spelling asked me to go and direct 
Vegas, right? And I was the first woman director working in Hollywood at that time. I mean, before it had been Lily Palmer years and years before. So I'm sent off to Las Vegas. It's 50 degrees in the shade, <laughs> July. And the whole crew are male chauvinist Watsits, and we're, you know, it's a sort of action picture in Vegas and so on and so forth. So I had to establish myself, and we had a big fight sequence. And my father had been actually an, uh, an amazing fight arranger, and he was called a master of arms. He'd won a silver medal in the Olympics in 36, and he used to arrange sword fights and everything. So I knew all about fight arranging. And the fight arranger said to me, he said, uh, you just sit on your chair, little lady, and I'll do this. I said, no, I'm the director. You just sit in my chair, little boy, and I'm going to direct this fight. And I was like, oh, I'm sweating like hell, and it's boiling hot, and I've got all this sort of chauvinist crew standing around and everything else. Um, and But the guy who played the lead in it, who was lovely, he said, let her do it. Come on, let's see what she can do. And I, d I designed this whole fight, and they were all utterly amazed, and that was really it. So, so from then on, you're just a legend, and people just yes, were queuing up to work with you. Yeah, yeah, I did Hill Street Blues, Miami Vice, L.A. Law, Law and Order, Star Trek, um, all these big shows I did, um, as well as making two or three independent movies and movies of the week and so on. So that was the beginning of my career in America. So were you were you completely based in L.A. then? Yes. Then we decided definitely to live in L.A. I had a boat there, the sun shone, we had a nice house. I mean, the first job I had, I made more money than I'd made in a year, in three weeks. I thought, I've died and gone to heaven. <laughs> so you always appreciated it then? Oh, of course I did. But I also, ha I was always in awe of being there. I mean, I'd worked with people that, you know, uh, Barbara Stanwyck, you know, I'd worked with, with, with um, all sorts of big stars, and I was always... I was always in awe of it all, even though I'd walk into restaurants and say, that's Gabrielle Beaumont over there, you know, and I'd have my own table at all the top restaurants and, <laughs> and everybody, you know, like I worked with such wonderful people. Robert Wagner was one of my best friends. I did Heart to Heart and oh, all of those right. shows. And, you know, it was, um, I went to his 50th birthday and he said, there's someone you have to meet, Gabrielle. So we walked towards this very tall, gray-haired man with broad shoulders and he taps him on the shoulder and he says, Greg, you have to meet the best young director I've ever come across, and she's a woman. And so Gregory Peck turns around and says, pleased to meet you, ma'am, I could do with a job right now. And I, I wanted the earth to open and drop me in it. Gregory, Gregory Peck was delighted to meet you, that's fantastic. So what kind of, so, so this is your life in L.A., so, yeah. so where are you living, which bit of L.A. are you? We're living in, um, up on Mulholland, overlooking <coughs> the valley, mm, off yeah, Mulholland yeah. Drive, um, and by this time I've got a boat. So what's the, tell us about the boat, where is it, where is it parked? It was Marina del Rey, it right, was yeah. only a little 30 foot sloop, it wasn't a big boat, <laughs> but you know, we had a good life, we had a lovely house with a pool. Um, the kids were doing really well and then my brother came over to live there he got a house which I helped him buy and I got him a, a job in, as a producer on a show and so we were all happy, happy, happy campers So are you in love at this point then? With what, LA? No, with, with a man Well with I'm married to You're married now so we've, we've skipped a bit with the marriage here so, we're, so how do we fall in love and was he American? Mm. <laughs> no because my parents had died young, and because I was supporting Christopher, I, uh, got, in, I, I got involved with an, uh, an actor called Olaf Pooley, wonderful actor, in London when I was 22. Um, we were just friends, and he was very sweet and very kind, kind of like a father figure, because he was 28 years older than me. And we used to go out and various things, and, and I ended up in bed with him after six months <laughs> and, <laughs> and got pregnant. <laughs> and so uh, he said, look, um, I, I don't want to get married again. I've had a disastrous marriage, but I will help you look after the child. No, he said, um, first of all, he said, I'll, I'll pay for an abortion. So we went to this abortion clinic and they kept us waiting 45 minutes. I said, that's it, I'm having the baby. So we went out, had a drink, and he said, look, I promise you that I'll, I'll help you with the child. I don't have much money. I'm an out-of-work actor, but I will help you with the child. And I'm hap happy to live with you, but I'm not going to get married. I said, OK, we'll give it a whirl. <laughs> so we had Amanda. And uh, my gorgeous darling, Amanda. Um, and so I was with Olaf from then on until she died.
Yeah. And that really broke up the marriage in the end. Yeah, yeah, quite. So all the time, when I first went to L.A., he was there and he, he worked as an actor and a writer and a painter and... He was he was he was great, and that, then I had Penny there helping me to you know. Well, and well, our Penny that uh, we've just seen this morning that was playing the guitar for us in our recent concert. Yeah. Our Penny, yes. Our Penny, our Penny, Penny Lane. Yes. Penny Lane, yes. <laughs> so she was uh, she was living with us, and uh, she also had a daughter, and so we had a. a fa and then uh, Olaf had a grandson who was the same age as Amanda, and he used to spend a lot of time with us, and um, so we were one big happy family, yeah, and yeah. just living down the road was my brother. And things were terrific, you know, right. really good. The career was great. Everything was fantastic. And then Amanda got cancer and died. And that kind of was very hard. And the marriage broke up, which often happens. He had children by another marriage, and but, but he, he couldn't cope. And, and she had been my best friend because yeah. he was tw eight, 28 years older than me. So she and I had done everything together because I was young and she was you know, born, and we literally went on holiday. We had the place here. We used to come on holidays here. We used to ride together, sail, ski, did everything together. And she went um, to college at 16. So she was very grown up, and we were very connected. And so I lost my best friend as well as my daughter. And Olaf had gone up into his shell a lot. He just wanted to paint all the time and write. He didn't, didn't want to even come over here anymore and stuff like that. So the marriage just disintegrated yeah. after that. And uh, then I met Michael, who was a, a director of photography on a film I was doing, and um, fell in love. And we had 20 great years together until he decided to join Olaf up there. <laughs> now, actually, Olaf only died last year, age 101. He was still driving, painting, everything. Uh, we, were, we were friends, though. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I miss him because we used to talk every Sunday. And, yeah. you know, we, we spent 25 years together and had a child, so, you know. So there was always somebody in, my, in the background. So th th if, not, if not, I could, have had so many, I could have had so many affairs with my leading men, so it was just as well I had a husband. Weren't you tempted? Weren't you tempted? I had a happy family. Yeah. You know, I had a daughter. I had a great, a great career. You know, I just like to flirt with them. It was fine. <laughs> well, of course, and, yes. And do you think they would have done what I told them to do on the set if they'd all also been bonking me? I doubt it. <laughs> Well, you better not put that actually, in. You better no, not put that in. I think that's a very good thing to to leave in. I think it, it adds a touch of realism. So I've, I've got this picture then of you living this great life in Los Angeles. You are very successful and you have a happy family life, thank God. Um, but where did Mallorca come into your life at all? And Fauna Luch, have we skipped a bit where that would have uh, linked in? Yes, that linked in and that to go back a little bit in that um, Olaf had come here in 1935 as a young student. His grandfather had left him 45 pounds and he and his um, German model girlfriend came to Mallorca and rented a little house in Puerto Solia, which he, they rented it, they had a maid and they rented the house and lived there for six months on 45 pounds, right? But then came the civil war and eventually the Brits were told, you better get out. So they sent a frigate into Puerto Solia and they evacuated the Brits. They wouldn't take the German girlfriend. <laughs> she had to find her own way home, but he'd had it by then with her, apparently. <laughs> but he shared a cabin with Robert Graves. And they became good friends. So cut to many years later when Olaf and I were together and he used to work a lot on films um, doing voice, uh, um, helping actors with their voice. For instance, he worked with Omar Sharif, Maximilian Schell, all of these people. And if he was doing a film, I'd go with him. Or sometimes I worked on the films too, doing um, editing, voice editing and so on. And there was a film made here called Krakatoa, East of Java. Mm, yeah. Yeah. with Maximilian Schell yeah. and they stay, all stayed at the Esmoli which wasn't quite finished at the time but Max Schell knew the owner very well and Olaf had done a couple of films with Maximilian Schell too and so he was asked to come and, and they were good friends so we came over and I fell in love with Mallorca I'd never been here before Olaf of course knew it and then after the film was finished um, by which time I'd had my daughter 
we came and stayed at the Canquette, which was run by William Graves at the time, a yeah. little hostile that William Graves run. And then, of course, we knew Robert because of the previous stuff and so on. And so we then rented a house in Lukalkari for a year. And our pen came too. Our pen came too, yeah, yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we stayed in Lukalkari. Uh, and then, then we ha rented a house in Dea for a bit. We decided we wanted to buy something. This was before we had really any money and hadn't gone to Hollywood or anything like that. And we couldn't afford Dea. And anyway, I found it too dark in the winter and dreary. So we found Fauna Luch. So we bought a house at the top of the village, up 300 steps, for $500. <laughs> And that was the beginning. So what, what year was that then? That was 1970. So then, in all your Hollywood years, this was your holiday home then, yeah, was it? Yeah, we came here whenever we could. And, you know, because of working as I did, I often had a stretch of weeks where... But I always uh, turned down any work in the summer holidays to be here with Amanda. Yeah. So this was, yeah, yeah, this is your place in the sun and yeah. your place in Europe. Well, yeah. Also, yeah. Olaf, before I went, we went to America and I was working in England, Olaf and Amanda would spend the winter here and I'd go back and forth. And she went to school in what is now the Petite Hotel, which was the convent. The convent of Fauna Luch, yes. was that, that's where the, the school was the school then, was. right? Yeah. And yeah. I remember one day, she's like three, maybe four, three, three, you know, she's sitting on the steps outside her house at the top of the village. I'm not going to school today. Uh -huh. Why not, darling? What's wrong? I'm not going. I said, well, is there something wrong with the nuns? No, nuns is all right. Children? Children's all right. What's the problem? She said, I don't like the reading and writing. <laughs> they made them sit in front of a blackboard all day writing at three and a half, yeah. which was why she went to university at 16. <laughs> Well, it was from a very good base of education. Oh, so, but these these were the days where they all sat in serried ranks, wasn't yes. it? I mean, they just there was no there was no kind of free association or play. You just sat in a, sat in a, sat well, they in had playtime. They had yeah. playtime, and she knew every kid in the village. And she yeah. grew up. She spoke Mayorquian, Spanish, French, English. You yeah. know, so yeah. that was. And she went to the French lycée after that, either in half a year in London and half the year here, because they what, do in the, Palma, the one yeah, in they, Palma. yeah they do the same yeah. curriculum. Yeah, they do. Yeah. So, so we and we would come every holidays, and then once we went to LA, um, you know, we would still keep coming here for an escape. Mm -hmm. Every summer, I spent here with her, and Olaf used to come too till he got. He'd rather stay in the beautiful house I'd bought him with a studio and everything else in LA. <laughs> so, so from this penury of the uh, of the orphan years, yes. then you made loads of money. Well, I don't know how much loads it was because I was supporting a huge family. I was supporting yeah. Olaf, my daughter, the stepson, I mean the grandson, our Penny, her daughter, um, helping my brother still. We had to have three cars because in LA you had to have three cars. You had to have a certain lifestyle, everything else. I mean, my monthly nut, the first year I was there, was 15000 a month cost me to live. To live? Yeah. To live? To live. <laughs> so how long did you? How long did the LA years last? What happened? Uh, well, after Amanda died, I went back to England for a bit, met Michael, and then we went back to LA because um, he lived and worked in LA a lot too with his f second wife. He'd had a disastrous couple of marriages, um, and uh, we bought a boat to live on because we were both sailors, and we thought this would be fun. Um, so we lived in the Marina del Rey beautiful boat. When I met him, he said to me, after we started an affair, he said, look, we've got to stop this. He said, I know you've just lost your daughter. And he said, I've been given five to ten years to live, so I don't think we should really get involved. I said, hey, let's have five good years. So we did, at 20. And uh, he loved it here. But towards the end, when he was getting sick, we decided to, to live here sort of more and so we sold up everything in LA but I used to stay with friends or my brother or whatever whenever I had a job to do because I had to go back and forth um, and then we started Cafe Med which gave him something to do as well and I went back and forth um, and we had the farm up the hill and um, he, I knew that he would probably only have two more years and I wanted him to really enjoy it you know um, and um, Oh, that's fantastic, but that, the the Fauna Luch experience for you uh, has been 
also very busy. I mean, you have developed a number of businesses here and renovated a number of houses, and this is all to do with your producing skills and style so that you can make something beautiful very quickly. Is that, would that be a true estimation of what you did here? I think that I, I definitely have a very artistic trait, and as time has gone by, and I haven't been working in the film business quite so much, except writing and so on, I have to have something, an outlet. I also have, apparently, an enormous amount of energy and drive everybody mad, <laughs> because I'm always on the go, and so it has to go somewhere, you know. And even now, at 75 coming up, I'm pretty busy all the time, and I have a boat, and I have my motorbike, and I've got my animals, and my house, and my projects, and writing a book, and so on. I couldn't be without that. I'd just lie down and die. Motorbike? Yes. Not a scooter? Well, it's... it's um, it's a 125 Honda, so it's in disguise as a scooter, but it's actually a 125 Honda. <laughs> now, this is boat radio, so tell us about your boats, the boats of your life. Boats of my life, yes. Couldn't live without a boat. I started sailing when I went to Ireland for the holidays, and my, I have an, had an elder brother, um, half-brother, who's left us now. Um, we used to sail these Shannon One designs, which were 21-foot clinker-built ash boats, quite heavy with a centre plate and a gaff rig, lovely old-fashioned boats, but you had to have some ballast, and so I used to be shoved in the bow. <laughs> There's a little bit of extra ballast in a, in a huge sort of, you know, life jacket. Although I, I was made to learn to swim quite early on. And so I just fell in love with it, and also I was with my big brother, you know. And so from then, we used to sail, and then we got our own boat, and... We were always on the lake because we lived on a big lake, Loch Derg in Ireland, and uh, we were always in it, on it, you know, whatever. Um, so those were the first boats. And then I, uh, and I lived on this terrible old boat on the Thames, which I'd said earlier. And then from there on, I don't know, we had boat, my brother and I. My brother used to spend as much of the summer holidays here as he could with, with Amanda and I when he was working because he adored her and he didn't have any family and he adored me. And he was into boats too. So we always had a boat here. We started with a little Delky Dory, and then we had a bigger boat, and then we had a, we had a big yacht here. I had a sailing boat, 37 foot sailing boat, and then we had the, the Menorchian, and then I've got, I've always had boats here. And I had the boat we lived on in LA, which I absolutely adored, which we completely restored. It was a 1960 Stevens motor yacht, all made of mahogany, and, um, you know, it needed a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> taking care of and now I have a small boat I mean it's a 22 foot fast little launch to go out I can take eight people and picnic and swim and so on um, so that's the history of the boats and I couldn't be without one that's fantastic so the, um, the, 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 uh, the days of LA and producing and not, not around so much then anymore it's more no, project based no not now uh, basically I'm, I couldn't direct anymore because it's too much standing around and I have bad arthritis, you know, I'm pretty active, but still I couldn't spend, what, 16, 18 hours a day on my feet, you know, wherever, deserts, lakes, winter, summer, too much. And I've directed for 37 years, and honestly, it's enough, you know, I've got the T-shirts now. And America's not like it used to be. It's changed completely, particularly since 9-11. It really has changed. Now that my first husband's gone, I used to go and see him every year because I was still fond of him. My brother lives there, but he has a house here, or has had a house here always, and visits me twice a year. Um, and some of my friends have fallen off their perch, I'm afraid, because they're older yeah. than me. Yeah. And every year, two or three of them, you know, that I started with when we were in our 30s, have gone. gone. Um, yeah. And the business has changed enormously, too. You know, I don't consider a lot of it real filmmaking anymore, what with all the special effects they have and all of the stuff and all the equipment and all the... You know, I used to make films the old-fashioned way, like David Lean. So it's not the same as it was. And at my age, it wouldn't be much fun. And on my own, too, because the, the 20 years before, Michael was my cameraman, so we were always working together. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very happy now. I live in this paradise. I've got four cats, a dog, a parrot, my smart car. <laughs> and, and your I, motorbike. And, and my your motorbike, motorbike. And my boat, yes. But I also, um, I've got now this great challenge of making a fantastic garden and parkland here because I've got all this wonderful land, virgin land. And um, that's my next 
uh, challenge. Plus, I am writing a book, and I've got, I have been asked to write a couple of scripts, which I might settle down to do. But I was so busy running the cafes and the restaurants and, and people's, doing people's houses. This move, which means that I don't now, and I had rental houses I was running. Now, finally, and without all of that, I only have to concentrate on what I want to do. So I should get down to, and I love to paint too, and I haven't had a chance for a year. So you, the, I mean, the word retirement really means nothing to you. No, of course not. No. Yeah. So I mean, your life continues to be full of stuff that the rest of the world want to hear. I mean, you can't stop this. Please, please don't stop this. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll try not to. <laughs> Well, I think we, we probably can wind up there because there's so much you've told us that could lead into three other three other conversations just concentrating on the different bits that we've learnt today. This has been absolutely fascinating and thank you very much for sharing your story with us at Boat Radio. And thank you too. It's been very nice.